Hello, everyone, and welcome to Think Like a Startup, our new Onshape webinar series where we host fireside chat type discussions on startup thinking with the people who know it best. Uh, these webinars are perfect whether you're in a startup or you're not in a startup, but you want to be working like you're in a startup. I'm John Hirschstick. I'm an executive vice president and general manager of the Onshape business here at PTC. I've spent my whole life building CAD and other software tools for product developers, but the best part of my job is meeting the coolest product developers and manufacturers on the planet. And in this webinar series, you get to meet them too. Great guest today, Scott Miller. He's the managing director of Dragon Ventures, and he spent 10 years leading the manufacturing team for iRobot. He's worked with literally hundreds of companies on how to get their products manufacturers. He, he well known in the Boston community, I think worldwide, is a total expert on all matters supply chain. Scott, welcome to the webinar. Well, <laughs> thanks for having me, John. I'm excited to be here. Yeah. Um, well, we're excited to have you here because the, the focus today, building resilient supply chains, really supply chains in general, red hot topic today. I just want to welcome our audience and I want to tell everyone, and I'll remind you again, we are going to take questions at the end, but you can ask your questions anytime you like during the webinar. You can post them as comments in your, whether you're watching on LinkedIn or YouTube, go to the comment area and just list your question as a comment and we'll try to get to all of them during the Q&A at the end. And so with that, let's get started. <laughs> so um, uh, Scott, I just wanted to say, I know we, when we met to prepare for this, I had mentioned you this idea of startups and companies that work like them. Are you seeing a lot of interest in, in larger companies that want to be more like startups? Is that a thing? It is. Yeah, you know, I think over the last probably five or six years, I've seen an increasing number of Fortune, 100 Fortune 10 companies that um, have a lot of interest in acting like startups, usually one of two different ways. One, they just want to learn how to move faster with a greater bias for action uh, because things are you know, accelerated um, in ways that they never have been before. And they want to be able to adopt some of that startup thinking to help inform their methodology going forward so they can be more competitive. So that's one type. The other type is established companies that want to break into a new area or vertical. So for example, you may have a large shoe company that's really, really good at building shoes, but now they want to get into consumer electronics where they see an opportunity and they realize that they just don't have a lot of domain expertise or supply chain partners or partners in general that um, are trusted that they know how to work with in this new area. And I think a lot of the principles that startups have um, apply, even though there's just a massive difference in scale between the size of the companies mm -hmm. and the startup. So it is, it is a thing. And I think every company I know seems to be having to do something new and differently, particularly in, in the world of, um, of supply chain. And so, so you now today, can you, um, Tell us a little about what you're doing now. We'll get to your background, but what you're doing right now. Yeah, so now I'm primarily working with startups, but I do have a few larger companies in my portfolio. And generally where I focus is helping them once they've been able to build a prototype. So imagine they design something and on shape, they print it out and they plunk it on the table. And they're like, hey, Scott, I have this thing. How do I make a lot more of them? And I can help them think through, you know, how. Do they uh, find the best partner for manufacturing? How do they understand the bill of materials designed for manufacturing assembly? And ultimately, you know, at the end of the day, how do they scale this into a commercially um, viable product? And just to get kind of right to the point, like the, the too long, don't read, you know, TLDR version of this whole webinar, like, are you, is it the kind of area where the people who come to you, you see the common top few problems that are like, oh yeah, these are the usual suspect problems right here that are like standard advice for you right off the bat. And if so, what are, what are those things? You know, we can kind of start at the end here. Like, what's sure. The, yeah. What's the magic. Yeah. So kind of the two main problems are one, the supply chain, especially on the electronic side, but not entirely. It's a mess. 
Um, and I'm, I'm sure we'll talk about that in more detail. So they're interested in learning more about it. We think about the unknown unknowns. So often we'll talk about um, kind of how the process works to make sure that they understand what they're getting into and how to manage that. And then the second main category is how do you pick a great uh, factory or great manufacturing partner? And if we peel that one back, there's a lot of different layers to that onion. Is it onshore? Is it offshore? Do you have them do the full design? Do you hand over, you know, drawings um, that are uh, tool ready? Um, but those are at a high level, the main thing. How do you deal with the supply chain and how do you pick, pick a great, um, a great factory? So when you pick um, a factory, you're still the one dealing with the supply chain matters generally. So I, yeah, you know, I think the dream, which never happens, is you write them an order, like send them a PO for 100,000 units, and then magically those parts appear sometime later. But in practice, I haven't met a factory yet that, and there's great ones out there, that can do the sourcing for everything you need on your supply chain. So inevitably, as a, say, a customer building a product, you're going to have to um, chase down parts and really work. Um, get your hands very dirty in the supply chain. I've never seen it be able to um, be handed completely to the factory. Do most of the startups you're working with know that before when they come to you, or is that like a revelation? Like, you know, I think there's so little still known about manufacturing, especially the first time you do it, that many times I haven't even thought about it. I mean, kind of the, I won't say the failure mode, but the, the, um, perception people have is they've built one of them and building a hundred thousand isn't that much more work. You know, I got one working. Why isn't it, you know, why can't I just scale that? And they don't realize that you can't buy everything off DigiKey, although it'd be nice if we could and get it like the next day, like that's magic. But if you're buying in volume, you know, there's other factors that come into play or that with 3d printing, it's so powerful. You, you know, you can basically print anything you can design but when you start going into higher volume um, techniques like injection molding, there's just fundamentally design rules um, that are different that you have to accommodate. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, by the way, you mentioned DigiKey and like, I still remember them from the seventies when I was working on electronics as a kid, right? They were around, they're an old time electronics supplier. And I've heard about them more recently too, you know, not just with you, but they've been around a long time. So let's, let's go to the electronics supply chain for a minute. So you said, would you say it's a mess? <laughs> yes, it's, it's, it's a mess. Okay. We'll keep it clean. Yeah. It's a disaster. Yeah, it's a uh, disaster. And right. when did it become, when did it move to being a disaster? Yeah. So it, in, at least in my experience, it really started with the onset of COVID that was yeah. just a massive disruptive force. And there's been all sorts of waves that have rippled beyond that. Yeah. Um, and do you have any advice for people? I mean, m most, of our, most of our listeners, most of the people who will watch this uh, webinar, whether live or on recording, uh, you know, if they're the product developers I work with, almost all of them deal with electronics. Not all, but, but most do. What's your top advice today for them to deal with the mess? Yes. So generally what we're seeing, or if we go into the problems and I can provide a little bit more background, maybe if it's helpful into yeah. how we got into this mess. So, and I'll admit there's definitely folks that know more than I do on the topic, but as I understand it, basically with um, COVID, a lot of the consumer demand fell off the, you know, uh, significantly decreased. So as a result, companies were sending back chips or just weren't taking orders. And this started to disrupt that supply chain. But then we started seeing the automotive um, come back again um, once people started buying cars. And as you know now, it can be really hard to buy a new car if you yeah. want to get it in a year or so. Um, that was coupled with consumer demand coming back. So what was no demand became a multi, you know, multiple fold on the previous demand. And there just wasn't the ability to build that many chips. It also gets a little trickier in that there's been a huge investment in the really small format um, chips. And that's where kind of the new stuff is, is headed. But for the legacy ones, uh, the larger, I think larger than 13 nanometers, um, 
that there just isn't a lot of investment dollars going into that. Hmm. The challenge is that much of that capacity is taken by cameras where you need a bigger area to be able to catch all the hmm. photos and also power electronics. Mm -hmm. um, so fundamentally, the with the iPhone, I think they have more cameras now than ever before. And there's also something like a thousand um, capacitors in an iPhone that that added to the demand much more than we've ever seen before. So in a sense, it was like a perfect storm where many of the parts that people need are just not available from a supply standpoint because the iPhone and the power electronics are taking all of them and the investment wasn't made in the smaller format stuff. So mm. for this, there's a huge supply shortage and that um, created massive, massive ripples. But towards your question on what do you do about it, which I think is the most important thing, what we're finding now is that you really have to make sure the parts are available before you do the design. Mm -hmm. In the old days, you just do the design, you'd get some stuff yep. from the key. And then, you know, months later, when you're sure the design is stable, you'd go to an Avnet uh, or something like that and be able to put in the big order. But today the paradigm is flipped that you'll make sure you get the, that you can get the chips and then you'll do the design from that point. So I think that's one of the best ways to safeguard yourself. That's really um, an incredible flipping of thought in a sense. Now, I know some of the people watching will be like, well, we always check on parts before we design things. But the general idea is you design something. Maybe you look at what parts are available. Um, but the, you're saying that you, you design around parts availability. Again, in some industries, some industries will be very different. Long lead times, military may be different and so forth. Um, fascinating stuff you just mentioned about the chips. Never thought of that. It's just kind of interesting to know that. 100 capacitors and iPhone, you mean discrete? I think 1,000 capacitors. Oh, like 1,000 capacitors. You mean discrete capacitors? Yes, yeah, so multi you know, capacitor. Um, wow, 1,000? 1,000, yeah. In, in my iPhone, I'm like, I got I got to take one of these apart and see what's going crazy. on. crazy. And there's sort of the concept of with the bill of materials, which is, you know, just the list of ingredients that yeah. go goes into the product. If you're missing one part, you really can't build the product. Right. So even if it's just right. like a silly tenth of a penny capacitor, you know, that you can't build your product. So it, it's, it's certainly tough. affecting the high-end chips, but also these little popcorn popcorn um, pieces too are, are significantly impacted. Yeah. You know, I'm hearing a lot more interest in, now in um, PLM, product lifecycle management software, which can be used for two functions, really. Sometimes it's used for PDM, what we call it product data management, basically managing CAD data while it's under design. But other, you know, the other one significant application is managing the bomb sort of downstream of the core design, you know, where you're sourcing and so forth. And um, huge interest in that. And full disclaimer, you know, PTC, we make um, uh, a couple of PLM systems uh, Windchill and Arena, um, and there's you know business is great with those. Do you think? And I, I'm guessing that all this interest in PLM is somewhat about about managing these issues. And are you seeing that too, or are you saying not a not a thing? PLM software in management. Yeah, so it's definitely especially as you build the higher volume um, products, it's absolutely critical to do it. I think where we see the the opportunity, we'll say, is that uh, in having spent a lot of time in the space, I think in my experience, every company, whether it's Fortune 10 or the smallest startup, is going to start with Google Sheets or Excel. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's basically just a vessel to hold the data. There's no knowledge. It's just a, a place to do it. But it's easy. And then there's still a bit of a gap in the middle and then when you're a huge company, Windchill is great or Arena or, or things like that. But sort of that middle size where you don't need a full-blown um, PDM, PLM system, but you want something better than, than Excel with a little bit more structure is, um, is something that I get really excited about. And the reason is with your bomb, uh, as we were just talking about, if you forget to order a part, you really can't build the product. So you've got to keep track of your mechanical, your electrical, your packaging, your stickers, your plastic bags, like all these different things. And each one has a cost, probably a minimum order quantity. Uh, it's got a lead time. 
And then it can even get more advanced that as you build in volume, there's the idea of volume stepped pricing. And you see this mm -hmm. on any digi key part that maybe one part is mm -hmm. a dollar, 10,000 is 90 cents and so on. Um, so there's a lot of data that it really quickly will overrun the capacity of what Excel can do. Or you get into column like ZZ, you know, like just it's way too um, wide of a bomb. So I think that there's massive opportunity. And again, the, the cost for making a mistake in there is severe, especially with the long lead times that we're seeing. Um, so that's an area that I'm particularly interested in. And I think there's a lot of opportunity for innovation there. Well, yeah, and I, I tend to agree. And what we're seeing is, again, I'm sort of a, this isn't a commercial for cloud native tools, but kind of is because that's my life. But, you know, the, the cloud native PLM systems are really, I think, bringing it to smaller companies than ever and also more distributed teams, which is super important. But, you know, and, and yeah, people, you know, people are running out of the runway with spreadsheet approaches to that, I think. And uh, yeah. so, so, um, uh, and we're becoming more conscious of the need to integrate uh, CAD and PLM, but I don't want this, this webinar isn't about CAD and PLM. It's about supply chain. Let me get back to it. You also were telling me about what's happening with um, a couple other problems, pricing. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about pricing, uh, counterfeiting, quality, those issues? Yeah. So often the challenge a company will face is they'll do the design, not realizing how messed up the supply chain is. And then they'll realize that, say, for an accelerometer, which should cost a dollar, that the lead time is now 72 weeks, which is kind of a non-starter. Like, and, 72 weeks. And it's that far off, like you don't even know if it's a legitimate 72 yeah. weeks or- it Might as well be 720 weeks or right. seven, you're, you know. Yeah, you're not right. going to like bet your business on getting yeah. that in like a year and a half. Yeah. So then you're like, all right, well, I really need this accelerometer. There's no alternates I can use in the market. So maybe I'll um, try to work with a broker and bring it in. And the whole trick here is finding trusted brokers. We've seen um, some of the companies we've worked with and, and know about have taken this dollar accelerometer and paid $30, so a 30X markup um, to bring them in. And then after some more testing, they realized that they're all counterfeit, like they didn't, they didn't work at all. Um, so it's incredibly painful that they've wasted all that money you know, and $30 for a consumer electronic product is kind of a non-starter. Like you, it's hard to absorb that much of a, um, a cost adder. But then all the time and effort to figure out that the parts are no good is a huge opportunity cost. Um, so yeah, it's one of these things where with the idea of early decisions cast long shadows, really knowing what are the parts that you need? Can you do what's called an approved vendor list or an AVL mm -hmm. where you identify drop-in um, um, alternates um, you know, so that it's not a single point of failure. And then if you do have to pull it in, knowing uh, trusted brokers that you can call on that will get you the parts. And typically what they're doing, because there is a limited supply, is taking older parts. We see them now from like 2017, 2018. And then they have a really robust quality process to make sure that they're still good and that they're legitimate. Uh -huh. um, so there's a lot of different steps in it, but you can really get over your skis. And you know, for a startup, you're probably short on cash anyhow. That if any of these mistakes can be um, quite quite painful. Now you talk about you know um, being flexible in your sourcing. I uh, I and mo many people read the story recent, relatively recently of Tesla, and this story you can read in the general media about them allegedly, and this is why I want to check it with you, the story about them, basically when all the automakers were running on chips, Tesla, Tesla was able to be um, agile and change, uh, chips, uh, change chips and still make the vehicle work. Is, is that a true story? Um, do, are you familiar with it? Do, do you think it's true? Yeah, so I had, um, you jogged my memory and I do remember you know reading about that a little while ago, the, and I don't know the answer, but I think it would most likely be true based on some conversations we had when we visited Tesla, probably in 2017. And with them, like ordinarily when you build a product, you won't make running changes if you can avoid it. And running changes means, or maybe said another way, ideally you'd make batch changes where you talk with your customers, you figure out what needs to be changed, uh -huh. and then you implement a whole bunch of changes at one date. 
a running change would be just sort of rolling it in as you go. But from what I understand, Tesla would do rolling changes on a daily basis. Um, and to accommodate that, this, they had to build their own enterprise bomb software just to keep up with it. Because when somebody calls with an um, uh, error in their car, you know, they'll say, oh, what VIN number do you have? And they have to be able to tie that to the actual components in the car. Yep. So based on their ability to be nimble here and really outcompete sort of legacy um, car companies, I wouldn't be surprised at all if they've been one step ahead of it with their double E's or electronic engineers yeah. being able to be smart on the supply chain. Because now, you know, that is such a key enabler, whereas before it was, you know, to a much lesser degree. And would that be an example of Tesla thinking like a startup? Yes, I think they yeah. just do a beautiful job. Although yeah. they also, I think, avoid a lot of the challenges of a startup. With the startups, typically they haven't done it before. So they are very innovative in thinking and often will question assumptions or don't have all this baggage. But I think Tesla is thinking like a startup, but also doing it with the basis of experience as well. Um, mm -hmm. So they've got kind of a unique combination of the two that makes them really powerful. I think when, when companies, you know, it's combining, you know, just like great music or food and wine or something, it's combining the best attributes of, of pure startup with, with obviously the, in some ways the rigors and discipline and uh, operational efficiencies, but that's, that's my own, uh, you know, bigger companies. Um, uh, let's, l let's, if we can, I want to move. Oh, I want to ask you, can you say why you were at Tesla? Is that something you could discuss? Oh, yeah. This was when I had my bolt hat on, which is a company okay. I was um, involved in a while ago. I think Ben Einstein had somehow arranged this amazing tour of Tesla. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> and I think in classic Ben, um, fashion, he was late to his own tour, but, uh, which is just uh, cracks me up, but it was yeah. incredible to be able to go and see that and then riding around on the bicycles and just how innovative they were. And when you're talking about startups, um, as I'm thinking about it, one of the key things that I think differentiates startups from larger companies as I work more with them is the willingness and ability to take risk because they have nothing to lose. Um, with a startup, you're going to burn cash and you know that you're going to be out of business in a finite amount of time unless you do something. Whereas I think often with a larger company, they have such access to resources that um, categorically people don't want to take risks. Like there's the old saying, nobody got uh, fired for buying IBM. Um, yeah. You want to be conservative and protect your job. And you know, it's going to be a long time if you lose your job before you can find a new one. Whereas a startup, like you're all going to be unemployed in some matter of months when you run out of money, if you don't take these bigger risks and you have nothing to lose. And I think Tesla has done a great job of taking those risks and being bold like a startup um, and somehow managing the fact that they do have something to lose, especially being a public company. Oh, they definitely have something to lose. <laughs> but they've, they've been able to handle that yeah. in a way that I haven't seen established companies. Uh, other yeah. Companies. Well, I think I think maybe that's that's why I think that's one of many reasons why we're seeing uh, more interest. But you mentioned with your bolt hat on, I just want to pick that apart for a moment and also go into your background. I promised people we'd go deeper into your background. Um, so many topics to cover, but so tell us, um, tell us what bolt was and let's go through like, how did you get to where you are today in your career? But I know what bolt is, but for, yeah. for the benefit of our audience. Sure. Yeah. So we started it, I think, in 2013, so a while, almost 10 years ago. And what we saw is that hardware's, hardware companies need cash yeah. more so than any type of other company. You know, Not only do they likely have a software component, but then you've got to buy the inventory and hire people with different skill sets. So they're very you know, cash intense. But at that time, not many um, VC firms had deep experience with consumer or industrial hardware. And we thought that there was an opportunity to kind of um, uh, create a portfolio of hardware companies, but also surround um, them with experts in the field that were our staff at Bolt. So we had an amazing industrial designer, doubly mechanical engineer, and so on. And by getting some of the efficiencies of scale, so for example, say we had a certain chipset that we knew was effective for like Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and could talk to the cloud, we could understand how that works and then share that with a different portfolio to be able to give them um, kind of a head start. 
And yeah. so this this chapter of your career, you were a venture, you were part of a venture capital firm. But if I remember, you weren't full time a venture with the venture capital firm, were you? No, I was. Yeah. The, there were three founders, and I was the the most minor of the. Yeah. The, so you were you were partly working as a venture capitalist in those years, and partly with Dragon. Yeah. So right? I, um, yeah. in terms of my career, you know, I had trained as a mechanical engineer. Yeah. A really cool robot fish for the Navy and graduate. So wait, go back. So how do you get in? How do you, what made you become a mechanical engineer? Oh, you know, I think that was in my blood. My mom tells the story of like being three and taking apart every toy I had. Okay. Um, often okay. much to her dismay, but I just think inherently mechanically. Um, yeah, it was always, I always knew I was going to be an Emmy. Okay, so you just knew that. So you went to college. Is it, did you do anything before college? That did design anything? You know, take apart cars. You know, like you oh, said. Sure. Yeah, yeah. You did I all was those kind things. of doing the usual things that Emmys do, taking okay. apart engines and cars, and yeah, and working on that. Um, thinking about designing robots. Okay, uh, robots. You were interested. Yeah, in, yeah, definitely. This was back in the mid or early seventies and eighties. So we didn't have Arduino's and three D printing or. Yep. Or any of that cool oh, stuff. Oh, yeah, I remember. I well remember. <laughs> like I said, I was into the DigiKey catalog, but I was ordering individual components, you know, like resistors, not chips. Um, but you were, so you were, so you go to college as a mechanical engineer, and then tell us this robotic, it was a robotic tuna. Is that? Yeah. Right? Yeah. So I'm, uh, I have a deep love of the ocean and had the chance to sail um, between college and graduate school from Boston to, to Tahiti. Um, and wanted to combine my love of engineering with the ocean. And MIT had the perfect program, which is uh, a degree in um, ocean engineering. So it was like heaven on earth for me. And what we were working on is this full-size 46 inch long robotic tuna fish for the Navy. And the idea was that by using um, mother nature as an inspiration, we could create a very high efficiency vehicle um, with a very different acoustic signature from a conventional propeller. Uh, mm -hmm. So, and actually you'll get a kick out of, out of this. You know, at that time it was the mid nineties where CAD was at its infancy, at least from my point of view. So mm -hmm. we wanted to get like the right hull form. So we went to Central Square and from a fishmonger bought a 46 inch tuna fish. We brought it back to the lab. Oh, wow. And basically we sent the thing through a bandsaw making one inch <sighs> stakes. And we'd put them on a piece of paper. You're going to be shivering. But we like would draw the outline of it and then lofted them together like old school. Um, not Old like, school. Old, like really lofting, not all this digital magic stuff. And uh, the funny thing was in the fish, there was these tendons. So you could think of her like a big puppet. The motors were off board. And then the, the tendons came through and would cause her to wiggle. But we were always afraid that the holes wouldn't line up in the bulkheads. Um, and yeah. we knew that we were never going to be off by like a 10th of an inch. It was always going to be like one inch or two inches or yeah. like we were really going to blow it. So we printed out on a 2D printer, the um, drawings for each bulkhead would hold them next to each other and then stick it up to the light to make sure when we look through them, yeah, lined up. Hey, and, you know, like, today my kids yeah. laugh at that. They like, they wouldn't even think to do that because the tools are so much better. Well, you know, it's interesting because one day I asked, I love visiting customers. I asked a customer who was using um, CAD really heavily, 3D CAD. I said, what's the biggest benefit? And he said, all the holes line up, you know, when I build stuff. But but um, no, I believe it. I, that doesn't, you know, it, does, it doesn't surprise me. So you're building, you're building this robotic um, tuna at MIT and sailing to Tahiti. So why on earth would you not have kept doing all that until this moment? Why would anyone no. stop doing those things? It well, then, sounds like you just sail back and forth and build tunas and, you know, yeah. but you, you, you stopped doing that. Yeah, um, well, it's point. pretty heavenly. The funny thing is the tuna ended up on the cover of Scientific American doing this oh, cool. crazy, crazy backflip. Like she totally, like she was a big puppet. She couldn't do that. But the thing that was even cooler, you know, a VP at Disney saw that, cover article and basically hired our whole lab from MIT to go work for Walt Disney Imagineering R&D, which was some of the most fun I've ever had in my life. So, oh, so you worked at, you worked at Disney. I was at Disney. Yeah. We were the first I never knew that. Disney labs in Cambridge and we were the first one just off of Rogers street. 
Okay, I'm going to see if we can dig up that that cover and show it here in the webinar. <laughs> oh, cool! Yeah, yeah I, I'm asking our our um, uh, one of one of our staff who's helping me here. I'm going to ask her if she can pull up this cover, um, and we can we can show it to everyone. If not, I'm sure you can Google search it and see it. Okay, so you go to Disney Imagineering, and now I got to ask you again: Why aren't you still there? <laughs> it sounds right. like an interesting place to be, but you're uh. not. It was amazing. Yeah. There is no budgets, meaning it just didn't matter. So I remember one day getting oh, wow. the old yellow McMaster car catalog and ordering like $50,000 of tools that came the next day. Um, <laughs> it was just it was a crazy thing for a kid that just graduated from school to have access to that. Okay. Um, but yeah, that was fun. I think, and we ended up building a full-size walking robotic dinosaur, which was a uh, which was a lot of fun too. But I think for me, the thing that caused me to go on to iRobot, which was the next stop, is that as much fun as the dino was, it just wasn't practical. It wasn't going to um, necessarily change the world or impact people's lives. Yeah. And iRobot at the day, we were working on probably 10 to 12 different business units from underwater acoustic modems to Lisp garbage collection to more fish to mine clearance to robotic toys and it was um i felt like there's a more of an opportunity to do something meaningful um but i wouldn't have given up disney for the world for those three years those were those okay were cool. so you so you go to disney and then you go to irobot yes and yeah, okay that was, it was a big change going from a billion dollar company with no budgets to this little startup nobody had heard of where um like everything even down to the toilet paper was different at iRobot versus Disney. It was just like night and day. And and this is where you learn about supply chain. Is yeah, right? we it, it, and we iRobot. learned the hard way. Um, you know, back in the late 90s, pretty much only big companies were doing consumer electronics and there wasn't a lot of knowledge around how to do it. So the way we learned is Colin, the CEO, negotiated a deal with Hasbro, basically where we'd set up a JV and our part of it was bringing them kind of cutting edge robotic toy ideas. And then they would help us take that and then scale them to high volume. Oh, so you learned, you learned from Hasbro. We did. We learned a lot of, in fact, I think everything I learned in my early days was from this guy, Adam Kraft, who ultimately worked with me at iRobot and um, Dragon and is now at Hydro. Um, oh. But yeah, I, I definitely learned from Hasbro. Those, okay. they were just such good engineers down there. Okay, and so then, um, so you work on um, uh, you work on some uh, on different products and sourcing them. Give us an idea what kind of um, volumes of product did you get? If, if uh, we're not looking for anything confidential, of course, but at iRobot, you know, what was what was the volume range you worked on min to max of the things you were sourcing there? Yeah, so for the first Roomba, we were planning to build, I think it was 10,000 units initially with an upside of 15,000. And that just seemed like such big numbers, sort of like hard to wrap the head around through three channels, Hammerker Schlemmer, Sharper Image, and Brookstones. Okay. Uh, and yeah. those were all like kind of high-end specialty channels. And the crazy thing is we um, sold through that in no time. Somehow we hit the nail on the head with the product market fit in a way that I don't think anybody realized would happen. That's great, actually. When that, when that. Oh, happened. it was a wild ride. Um, so our, my problem is the person in charge of manufacturing, and at that time I had moved over to China um, for a, it ended up being about four years. Was we had this insatiable demand that how do we scale as quickly as we can? And I've really never. I guess I've worked with some companies like Ring and Dropcam that had that, but it's really rare. And I was so young that I didn't realize how lucky we were. But then we would scale up to sort of the hundreds of thousands. And wow. um, I think in my tenure, the most we ever built was about 40,000 a week, which 40, is- 40,000 a week. 40,000 a week, which is, um, you know, that will fill up a pretty good warehouse. It's pretty, it was sort yeah. of like going at, if you think at the end of Raiders of the Lost Ark, in that warehouse. That's what the Roomba warehouse uh, is like. I mean, okay. it was like 20 feet tall as far as the eye can see. Wow. So 40,000 a week. So that'd be a rate around, you know, analyzed a couple million a year. That's, yeah. that's a lot. Now I know some people of course make higher volume things, but most of the listeners 
will not be. That's that's so that's a pretty so you've had a lot of experience with a broad range. And so so then you why did you and, and so then you left iRobot to start Dragon? Is that yeah, I had an amazing yeah. 10 years there, but I think that the entrepreneurial bug started to get under my skin. And what yeah. I found is people would come to me saying, Hey Scott, I built this thing. You know, what do I do now? I can get to one, but I want to get to a hundred or a thousand. Yeah. And at iRobot, I think we had launched eight or 10 products under sort of on my watch yeah. and it was all good, but I was ready to sort of take the next step. And uh, yeah, jumped, I left on great terms. iRobot, I still think incredibly highly of. Um, in fact, I think they've done amazing things for the Boston ecosystem in terms of like, if you think of a dandelion with seed spreading to create all these other really impressive companies, but left in 09 with the sort of the recession had just hit. We had one kid out, one kid on the way, and I just quit. Like, um, I sh if I was smarter, I should have gotten laid off to get a little bit of a severance <laughs> because I'd been there for a while, but I had such conviction and passion. Yeah. And I look back on it now. I was like, what was I thinking? And I realized what a great wife I have to let me do it. But yeah, yeah. Started, yeah. which goes a long way. Um, yeah. It started Dragon Innovation to basically take what we had learned doing it the hard way and then help other companies being able to navigate from prototype to production, you know, hopefully being able to see around corners and make new and different mistakes. So, um, uh, well, in is Dragon Bolt, and then you sold the original Dragon company, and now you have a new company, Dragon Ventures, right? Yes, yeah, sort of sticking in the Dragon theme. Yeah, That's the cool. old Dragon, we grew to about 40 people um, around, with a global footprint. I think we had seven offices around the world. And um, as you noted, we'd raised some money from Amazon and Foundry and Flybridge and then sold to a, a great um, electronics component uh, company, Avnet. Um, but then after about 12 years there, sort of the entrepreneurial bug got into me again. And uh, yeah, the new dragon, it's, I, it's just me. So it's, um, you know, I, I don't have any intent to scale it, but help a little bit different, um, still prototype to production through advising, consulting and investing. So sort of trying to broaden um, my offering and, and think through, you know, what do hardware companies need to succeed? Yeah. And OK, now back to that. There's a whole nother set, of, uh, a whole nother topic area that um, I'd like you to touch on, if you would, which is we talked about like navigating the crazy disaster mess of electronic supply chain. Let's talk about you talk to me about helping people decide where to make something and how to choose a contract manufacturer or group of them. Tell us about that. How do you approach that? Yeah, so I think this is by far the most important decision you'll make is getting okay. a great manufacturing partner. And I think of it like a marriage, that if you've got a great partner, you can do anything. But if unfortunately you don't have a good partner, then it's very hard to succeed. So you wanna take your time and, and get this one right. Um, in terms of the way I start thinking about it is one, it's always best to build locally if you can. The biggest challenge in manufacturing and, and maybe in life is communication. So being able to drive down the road and speak in the same language and pick up a part and point, um, you know, and say, oh, move this hole here and this hole there is just a lot easier if you're, you know, within driving range or worse, you know, airplane range in the same country. Um, so that's the preference. If you can't do that, then we start looking further away. And I spent a lot of my time building in China. Um, I think Vietnam is coming along. Malaysia is amazing. Um, mm. Certainly Mexico, where I don't have quite as much experience. And then Europe's got um, some great factories as well. Um, but always start, in my opinion, start local and see if you can do it there. And if you can't, then look beyond that. And things that you may consider are, one, have they built similar products? I remember when we were looking for new Roomba factories, we'd get this great dog and pony show. And then in their showroom, there'd be a stapler. And like, <laughs> like you guys built a stapler. That's nothing at all like the highly integrated electromechanical system we have with the Roomba. That's pretty so, funny. That's a great, that's a great <laughs> one. Yeah. Yeah. See, they've got it like, a, a I mean, it doesn't have, to, it yeah. probably shouldn't be exactly the same thing, but at least yeah. be in the ballpark. Um, the team is really important. And even within certain factories, there's A teams and then less, less high performance teams. You want to make sure you've got the, the best ones. I'm working with one, um, I've got a customer in Norway building a product in China at a factory and the team in China is just blowing me away how good they are. I've never mm. seen 
um, a better manufacturing team. And it's just such a joy. It's a complex product, but just such a joy to work with people that are just at the top of their game. Um, so that's what you want to find. And it could be in China. It um, could be in the US. Um, it could be anywhere, but you've got to get the A team to be able to, uh, to do this. With manufacturing, we often break it down to cost, quality, and schedule, and then just making sure that those line up. One of the challenges um, that we face in the US, um, with, which is both good and bad, is there's a much higher labor rate here than you might find offshore. Yep. Um, so depending on what you're building, if it's a military product or industrial, it probably doesn't matter. But if it's a consumer electronic product, you have to sell for under 100 bucks and it has a lot of labor content, then it can be more challenging to, to get the math to work. Yeah, would you say the labor, people are probably, some people are familiar with, but you told me the labor costs, you gave me a rough spread, like the 80 to 8 thing. Could you revisit that? Sure, yeah. So typically in China, the loaded cost I'm seeing on average is about $8 an hour. And that's in sort of the, on the seacoast. So Shenzhen up to Shanghai. And in the US, it varies depending on the factory, but sort of 50 to $80. Yeah. So, you know, for an hour of labor, which isn't that much time, if you consider, say, a Roomba to put something of that complexity together, the labor can really start to add up. And typically the way the factories work is they'll apply a margin, their markup on top of the labor. So it's kind of a double whammy. Um, Okay. And then I just want to remind people for a moment, you can post questions in the comment. We have a bunch of them we're going to get to in a minute. And I just wanted to um, get back to, I want to ask you about your YouTube course, because I saw your lecture on where to manufacture on YouTube. It's from, I think about, oh, you know, seven, eight years ago. But I, I found it really interesting. I think I saw you give that at a conference years ago. Uh, mm. Maybe where it was recorded. Anyway, it's on YouTube. If you look for Scott Miller um, on YouTube, and I, I forget the title of the video, um, but it's about choosing where to where to make anything. Right? Is that is that video? Is, are the approaches of years ago still good? Because you talked about the different decisions. I thought it was fascinating. Yeah, I haven't watched it in a little while. It's always hard to watch myself on video, so sometimes I yeah. avoid it. But um, but I think what I um, my advice would not have changed since then. Yeah. It still comes down to finding a great partner with the relevant experience and communication as the first and foremost, and then getting the cost, quality, and schedule to, uh, to line up. Yeah. And you also talked about, you know, like you were just saying, if there's a lot of labor, like in apparel, you'll hear if it's a highly automated process and you explain why, you know, bottles of shampoo are made in the United States for United States customers, right? Because, right. you know, and... And so forth. I found the video really good. I just wanted to check in and see if it was. So it sounds like you still would recommend it. And then all the chaos in in China with zero tolerance approach to COVID and everything. How is that affect? You know, are you seeing a lot of your clients affected by you know factories in China shutting down and so forth? Is that and what what should anyone know or do about that, if anything? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I think ten years ago, the knee jerk reaction was if you're building a consumer electronic product, build it in China, which it's never good to do anything knee jerk in manufacturing. Um, it would be good to look around, but China just has such an amazing supply chain, domain knowledge. Um, I mean, they've been building things since 1980. So there, at that time, was a lot of reason. What we see today is it's a 14 to 21 day quarantine period. So it's kind of a non-starter even to get into China. We have significant tariffs that vary, but nominally they're 25%, which again, on consumer electronics is real. There's all sorts of political tensions. And I think practically, you know, it's just, if you hadn't done it before, it's hard to find who you should work with in China. Like, how do, you, how do you build up that trust? I'm lucky that I've been doing it for over 20 years and have built up um, great relationships with really trusted partners. But if you are starting from scratch, it's tricky. You know, how do you find the right, the right person knowing it's such a, a critical decision, especially when you can't travel there? Um, Zoom is yeah. good, but it's not the same thing as walking around the, the factory floor and looking with your own eyes and going out to dinner and, and building the relationship. So yeah, I think there's a lot of challenges um, for companies that want to build in China. But if you can figure it out, I think it's one of the many viable options. Um, yeah. 
so there. it's it's still it's still a, a craft and art and not you know not a simple science it sounds like and and um, hey let's go to some questions all right I, I'm gonna kick it off with uh, could you offer any advice to U.S. based companies exploring manufacturing offshore in regards to protecting intellectual property any tips from your experience would be great I'm reading some audience questions coming in from the audience and other sources here. But yeah, can you, can you, uh, uh, sure. you protect it? Yeah. yeah. So there's a couple of different ways to do it. And it could be, um, it doesn't really matter where it is. Um, but step one, as we talked about, is picking a great partner. Um, that's kind of the, the foundation. Mm -hmm. If you don't have that, then you've got a whole host of yeah. problems. But within that, there's um, two different lenses to look through. One is the organization of the factory. And simply, there's three levels. There's the owners, the engineers, and the workers. Generally, the, um, the owners are never going to give away your IP or because they'll go out of business, um, especially if you're working with a reputable factory. Like That's the last thing that they want to do is have you lose IP because if the word spreads to their other customers, you know everybody will be concerned and leave. Um, again, assuming you're working with a known factory that's, that's reputable. Mm -hmm. So I don't worry as much about that. The workers generally um, wouldn't have access to the files up until just a few weeks before the product ships. So you have to assume if you're building a good product, every of your competitors is going to take it apart. And that might give them a couple weeks head start if they could figure out where you're building the factory, where you're building. Um, and I guess with this, it, it also is uh, um, it, it should be said that you should keep your factory se secret. You don't want to tell everybody where you're hmm. going. That yeah. makes it easy for them to figure it out. But the thing you want to worry about is the engineers. And um, that's because they have access to all of your files really, really early on. So towards this, I've always been a huge fan of having feet on the ground in the factory with your team. Or it's sort of what we did with my last company, uh, Dragon Innovation, so that you build that relationship and really have an eye as to you know who's talking to who and what's happening. Um, mm -hmm. And then also working on a need to know basis. So, you know, don't give more information than you need to. Certainly from, a, say, a CAD sharing standpoint, the more you can control permissions and not have it so they can email the files around, you'll be much more protected. Um, so yeah. I think that's a, a key thing. Um, Actually, if I can just elaborate on that, just because you mentioned it, you know, the key difference we always talk about with Onshape um, or any cloud native um other cloud native tools, there are no other cloud native CAD systems that we know of that don't rely on copying files. But if you use Onshape, files don't ever end up at the contract manufacturer. They can even edit. You can allow someone to edit or certainly to quote on things. But even editors don't get rights to download or copy anything unless you give them that permission. So with any other system, files get downloaded to, to the user in China and you can't ensure what happens to those files. With Onshape, your IP is never copied to other, other parties. And so we also give people incredibly detailed analytics on who accessed what, when, and from where. You can get a map that shows where your IP was accessed on Earth in the last you know, 24 hours or 24 days or two years or whatever you want. So anyway, just a little sidebar. That's, there are some technology aids you know, in addition. So anyway, yeah, go on, though. You were gonna oh, that's huge. You know, yeah. And then just having good IP hygiene, so don't leave things laying around or your computer open. Um, but that's yep. from the organization. And the other one is from a systems perspective. So simply, there's electrical, mechanical, and software. With mechanical, once it launches, everybody can you know reverse engineer it to a large degree. It's like it's right out there. With electronic, if they want to invest the time and money, for, they they can also reverse engineer it. Um, they can X-ray the board to figure out where your traces are. Um, mm -hmm. you know, there's ways you could take the silk screen off the chips to make it a little harder, but if there's an economic reason, they'll do it. And I've even heard of them doing, um, basically slicing the lid off of a, um, integrated circuit to try to figure out what the software is. Oh, uh, wow. So like okay. if there's enough money, they'll go after it. Yeah. But the one I like to protect is the software. Um, in, in some ways, if you let it out, it's the easiest thing to steal, but if you protect it, it's usually where most of your IP is. And in most of the yeah. modern chips, there's this concept of a bootloader, which is a little bit of reserved memory in a chip where you can put um, a decryptor. And basically, we would 
mail to the, or email to the factory, the encrypted software, but we had programmed the bootloader in the chip in a very secure um, location. And for us, we always used at iRobot AppNet. That was a great partner. Um, we, because once the keys to the kingdom and that encryptor get out, then your software is open for anybody to see. So you really want to protect that, but you also want to be able to update mm. your software on a regular basis. Um, so yeah, I think organizationally, watch out for the engineers, um, which I joke because I'm an engineer. And then on the yeah. uh, other side, try to protect your software as much as you can through a bootloader. Okay, a bunch of other questions here. I'm going to say that's great, great advice. Um, Scott, what do you recommend for simple bomb and SKU planning software for startups that you are working with today? Yeah, I mean, that's, I wish I had a great answer for that question. I, um, as noted, I've seen most companies start off in Excel or Google Sheets and then, um, the you know, I, we've got many of our customers using Arena, which is awesome. Um, the trick is finding one that does electrical mechanical soft uh, packaging, like all things that have atoms in it across the board. And I think that's still a huge opportunity um, out there. I haven't seen any, um, if we did an FFT of the space, there'd be no spike. Uh, I think arena would be the tallest spike, but everything else um, it's sort of a mishmash. And I'm, I'm still looking for that magic software that's modern, easy to use, approachable, doesn't cost a fortune. Um, that at some point will give you a path to get to enterprise, um, but you don't need to deal with all the um, overhead of that upfront. Okay. And uh, can you speak to the technical education gap in the U.S. and talent shortages? We're seeing so many challenges manufacturing New England, finding machinists, CNC operators. I feel like you know we lost a generation. I'm reading the the comment here of technical skill base with the education system in the U.S. and a decline of vocational education. Yeah, great topic. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I I think we all feel that acutely. The um, there's a massive gap, and I don't, especially compared to to China, um, which is where I have a lot of experience. Um, but yeah, I think it's it it is a huge challenge to get people. Um, to train as machinists or technicians. Um, and I, I don't know what the solution is there yet. I mean, in some ways we're going more towards automation um, to try to help um, with that. But the challenge I have with automation is it's so hard to build the product in the first place. And then you have to build a product that builds the product. And then every time you change your product, you've got to change the robot. So I think we may get there eventually. Um, but yeah, that's one of the huge gaps that I think makes it um, like there's nothing better than manufacturing onshore down the road. But that's one of the um, the challenges we have is there's just not enough people to, to do that. I, I agree with the problem. I do see points of light like, you know, what's happening in STEM education, first robotics, VAX robotics, other teams. We're very involved in it at PTC and Onshape. There's a PTC education team. We've had... Um, almost uh, 2 million education users sign up for Onshape. Um, we're having schools and school districts sign up in bulk. Again, you know, a little, little biased because my opinion, but the emergence of these tools becoming cloud-based makes them easier. When they're cloud native, they have to run on Chromebook and iPad to be used in education today, the tech. And finally, with Onshape and, and um, uh, Chromebooks and iPads, you can bring STEM education even into places that didn't have the money or staff. And so, but that's a small part of it. We all need to work on it. We all need to push. Everyone here has a role to keep, keep advancing the agenda. And also I think making, I love seeing the shows on TV that make uh, battle bots and things that make design and manufacturing and building things exciting and interesting. We're competing with sports and video games and things. Um, uh, Scott, any, I'm now I'm going to race through questions because we're running out of time. A uh, anything like Dragon's product planner software, which they tested out, do you know anything that you'd, you'd say, or does the same comment about PLM that you mentioned earlier, Arena and so forth um, hold? Yeah, I think I still deeply believe in what we were trying to do with product planner, especially from a bomb standpoint. Um, and there may be packages out there um, that do the same thing or do it better than we did, but I'm just not aware of them. So as people um, 
are listening to this and have suggestions, I'd love to hear what they are. Okay. Yeah. And we have, you know, we, um, um, there's a lot of people in the Onshape community building software. There's a lot of partners, um, to my list. Um, but, uh, uh, a lot going on and, uh, you could check out the Onshape app store for some ideas and, um, uh, uh, arena, as Scott said, very popular, particularly in industries like electronic and med device. Um, I'm going to take one here. Are there any efforts, open source or commercial, to close the gap between traditional CAD PDM systems with cloud-based CAD, file portability? Um, uh, I would say uh, the answer is those situations get better every day. And we have, you know, there's extensive, we have great translators and tools in Onshape. We also have a, an incredible amount of direct editing tools. So if you don't bring in all the features, you can still change shapes in incredibly powerful ways. And I would say, check that out. There's a great um, Onshape forum. If you go to onshape.com, I think it's might be our, our URL forum.onshape.com. I go there all the time. I, can't remember the URL at the top of my head here. I'll try and verify it for you. You can look up there. A lot of great resources. And yes, it's getting better and better. The um, ability to move geometry around, even mesh data. We just came out with great ways of even editing and combining mesh data with precise solids. Um, Scott, another question here. Great hard software and hardware seem to be the central challenge of new companies having to do both extremely well. What can you say to new startup or I'll say startup people and big companies, how can they achieve excellence in both software and hardware? Yeah, I mean, it is that's why hardware is like the Olympics of start of startups that you've got hardware to do. Hardware is the Olympics of startups. I love that line. That's uh, true. It's, a, it's a good challenge. Um, I mean, we're lucky now that we can stand on sort of the shoulders of giants and there's a lot of um, really skilled people that over the last 10 years have been developing their trade, be it had a on the UX side or the UI side or the hardware design or DFM or DFA. But I think trying to connect with some of them, um, either looking at the work that they've done out there already or finding them on LinkedIn can be a great way to get started. What you probably don't want to do is learn it from the ground up, but sort of work at the kind of the current state of the art and then try to build on top of that. Hmm. And I'll just add in, again, these are largely direct to you, but I'll add, we're seeing companies say, we want to build our hardware the way we're building our software. They want to use agile process. Um, they want to use branching and merging. They want to work more with the, the world that you see of software development. And we're seeing that as a trend. Um, we'll probably have a, a upcoming webinar on agile process for hardware with, uh, hopefully I can get a mutual friend of ours um, who's an expert on it to come in and talk about that. Um, uh, and, uh, and then from the software side, I always find you can, you can give people, you can meet in the middle and focus on customers. And once the software people see your customers using hardware, they come along quickly. Um, uh, I just want to, I think it's time to wrap up. The time flew by. I want to offer on behalf of our live viewers and many people who will watch this on recording in the future. Huge thank you, Scott Miller. Dragon Ventures. I'm going to thank you on behalf of everyone for taking your time to be here today and share with us a little bit of, I think, fantastic insight based on your experiences with hundreds of companies. Um, so, Scott, thank you for coming. Oh, well, thank you for having me. I always love these talks, John. Oh, well, and I want to say if you want to um, learn more about Scott, what he's up to, I know he's pretty selective about taking new clients these days, but dragonventures.org. Um, is his website or on LinkedIn, Scott Miller. There's many Scott Millers. Look for this one and email scott at dragonventures.org. And to our audience, thank you for tuning in today's Think Like a Startup webinar. I invite you to stay engaged with Onshape by subscribing um, to our LinkedIn or YouTube channel and keep an eye out for our next episode in this Think Like a Startup webinar series. Uh, on behalf of all of us, thank you and see you next time.